And so hello and thank you for joining us at um, English Fest at Anglia Ruskin University, ARU. Uh, we're here today to talk about studying English at university. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Dr. Cassie Gorman and second year student, English literature student, Olivia. Um, and Cassie's going to talk to us about studying English at university. And then at the end of the session, that's your opportunity to ask any questions that you might have, either of Cassie, or you could ask myself uh, a question from an admissions point of view, or speak to Olivia as a student. She's got the real insight into what it's like to study English literature at university. So I'm going to hand over to Cassie. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Can I just check? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Wonderful. If at any point you can't hear me, because I was explaining to Sarah and Olivia earlier, I'm having a slight tech glitch in my office this afternoon. Just say in the chat if I turn into a robot and Sarah will pick that up and inform me. Uh, but I'm going to have a go now at sharing my screen, so bear with me. So hopefully now everyone can see my presentation, the front slide of which says studying English at university. So as Sarah was saying, this is an introductory talk, just to give a very general overview of what you might expect from studying an English degree course at a university. And of course, different courses and different degrees, um, whether you're doing English literature as a straight single honours option or whether you're looking to combine it with another discipline. Different degrees will offer very different things so this is a very selective general overview and definitely do your shopping with this. Look around as many different universities as you can, trawl through their websites, look at their reading lists, um, see what interests you best. So I'm going to go through, let me see, here's my overview, hopefully you can see my second slide. Why study literature? So to start from that general question, um, why study literature at all? Why is it important? Why does it mean something as a degree today? And then we're going to have a look at what an English degree might look like. And also, as, as Sarah was saying, at the end of this session, so once I've talked for a bit through these slides, um, you'll also have the opportunity, as well as asking me any questions or Sarah any questions from the admissions point of view, you'll have the opportunity to talk to a real life current student, Olivia, who's in the second year of studying English literature. And I, in fact, taught Olivia this morning for a class on Paradise Lost, on Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, so you'll have the opportunity to chat with her, which is really great. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the discipline stuff, some of the work stuff that goes into it, and in particular about the skills that you get from studying literature, critical thinking and reading being key ones. And then I'll close with a note on transferable skills and also employability, which isn't often a word that is maybe associated directly with studying literature by, by some people. I think there's often an assumption that literature, in contrast to a more profession oriented degree, like a business studies degree, et cetera, that the literature maybe doesn't lead so much into employability. But actually, I want to say, even though I have my bias as a literature lecturer, I want to say with great sincerity that literature is one of the, the best degrees you could study in terms of transferable lots. It's all about recognising them. So I'll close with that. OK, so starting then with what does it mean to study literature? So literature and notice here actually that I've mentioned literature instead of English and one thing um, that I think is really interesting to, to talk about as students and as, as teachers of English or of English literature is, is what that title actually means. So by English, we don't just mean um, texts from the British Isles. We mean um, texts written or translated into English um, from different places and different time periods. So it's actually an incredibly rich, broad subject area. And that makes it, I think, especially important to really look around at different universities, look at different course structures and figure out what most interests you, what most appeals to you. So literature, the study of texts, is, as you might expect, a truly multidisciplinary subject. So it's not just one discipline, not just one subject. If you study literature, you're automatically studying history, politics, psychology, philosophy, media, art, geography, science, and I'm sure we could add many other disciplines to that list as well. This is a degree that's about 
people. Um, it's about reading people and about understanding people, exploring different perspectives and points of view. It's about records from uh, across time and, and space, in fact. Um, it's about the world, studying the world, and it's about the power of language in all sorts of different ways. And as I put, sorry, I realise I will just minimise the screen at the bottom. <laughs> I realize this, um, that was blocking my slide. As I put on my final point here, that one thing that makes studying literature very special, from my point of view, is that it does give you an opportunity to encounter different voices, whether in the form of a spoken text or a written text. And of course, we think mostly of written texts, um, as we often think of, you know, it's reading, reading books when you study literature. But it gives you that opportunity to encounter different voices that would otherwise be far away in space and or time. So these different perspectives, different voices that you might not otherwise encounter. And I think that's that's truly exciting. So continuing onwards with why studying literature, why study literature? So reading widely and studying literature, it trains you to think critically. And this is a word critically that I'm going to bring up a few times over the course of this talk. So to start with it here, you will, as part of your study, explore complex subjects from diverse perspectives. So studying literature, it, it teaches you, I think, to see things from more than one point of view. And often what we do in seminars and workshops and lectures is to complicate things. We, we complicate readings. We think, well, how might there be more than one meaning or level of suggestiveness there? Or we complicate particular arguments and think, well, how might it be more nuanced than that? Um, how might we challenge that further? So you do get to walk around in other people's shoes quite a lot. And um, I think that's it's, it's, it's an incredibly, well, it's just a really great and quite, quite liberating opportunity, I think, to, to try out different ideas, to challenge things um, and rethink received ideas, as well as to explore diverse perspectives. And as part of that, you do deepen your understanding of yourself and of others. So it's a very developmental degree in that aspect. And again, connected to that, reading widely and critically broadens your horizons. So this connects with what I put on the previous slide about learning more about people and the world. Um, that is part of a literature degree. And then connecting with employability, which I'll come back to towards the end of my of my talk, you pick up many valuable transferable skills for life after an English degree. So whether that's in further study, so you might choose to go on to do a master's degree and or a PhD or in the workplace. So key to studying literature, you know, inherent to the very discipline and the practice of studying it at university are commu communication skills, critical thinking, independent study skills, team working, time management, and much more. Right, so for my next few slides, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what an English degree or what a literature degree can look like. And I'm going to especially be talking about our English degree at Anglia Ruskin, so our undergrad undergraduate English literature degree. Of course, I don't know I'm repeating myself here, but you you will, as if you're interested in doing this degree and pursuing it further, you will look around at different universities, different courses, and you'll see that they offer slightly different um, papers, modules, depending on their staff research interests and um, the interests of the university. But just to give you an idea, here I've got six pictures, six portraits of um, six authors and they're six authors of many but just to give an example of some of the authors that our students study in their first year so all these students all these writers sorry are um, figures that our students study in their first year so the top um, my left hand corner hopefully your left hand corner as well we've got Zadie Smith and then to her right Shakespeare and then to the right of Shakespeare Oladar Equiano a late 18th century writer who wrote an autobiography um, based on his experiences um, being sold into slavery and later buying his freedom. 
And then beneath Equiano, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales. Then to the left of Chaucer, we've got Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And finally, we've got Samuel Beckett, looking very serious there, who um, wrote, wrote a lot, amongst other things, Waiting for Godot, and was especially famous for his absurdist theatre. So these are just six of the writers that we look at with our students in first year. But I think already it starts to show the range in time period, in style of writing. So here we have plays, poetry, novels, um, an autobiography. And um, we, we do encourage, especially in first year, and I think this is typical across different deg degree programmes, we encourage a year where you really do explore and try out different types of literature or different themes, different interests. And then as you continue on with your degree, you start to narrow your focus further as you choose more, more optional modules, um, depending on what you're most interest, interested in. Okay, so what an English degree looks like. You will notice the difference from A-level or your equivalent prior study and I think it's best just to acknowledge that because it's the same for absolutely everyone. Everyone, and myself included, because I remember it well, my first year of university, you notice that the change in, in workload, the change in reading and a slight change in both in intensity, but also, I think, in independent learning. And one thing I'll say is don't worry if that feels very new at first because it, you will get into it so you will start to build your own routine um, your own rhythm your own rhythm and you will um, develop as you go along necessarily a techniques and approaches to, to managing your work and that might be something that you'll find interesting perhaps to talk with Olivia at the end who I'm sure would share reflections on how starting the degree was for her so it varies from university to university but in your first term or semester, you're likely to have on your average English literature degree, two to four modules or courses or papers. So that would be per semester um, with weekly set reading for each module. So at Anglia Ruskin, our, our first years have, um, in their first semester actually, they have two big, big modules. In their second, they have three. And with their two big modules in, in, the, in the first semester, there'll be um, their primary reading will likely to be, let's say, if I say a book per, per module per week, a book could be anything from a collection of poems or a novel or a play or excerpts from another text. Um, and there might also be some, some critical reading in appendage to that. But you'll have you'll have weekly set reading for each module or paper or course that you're doing and your your tutors and your your module leaders your lecturers will of course be working closely with you and are there to support you as as you do get used to that to that amount of reading and, and the routine of um, higher education work as you continue with your degree you'll have more choice about what what you study and that's especially the case as you move to the second and third years and I will give um, a little bit later just an overview of what our, our second and third year modules look like so you can see how um, the options start to open up as you gain more experience in studying different periods of literary history and, and different themes and texts. One thing I'll just say about reading actually, um, a few tips for managing reading workload at university do use summer vacation reading lists. So most universities will contact their students, their incoming students, the summer prior to them starting university to say, you know, here's a list of um, some primary texts that you're looking at, or here's an indicative reading list, um, just to give you a taster of what's ahead. Do use those summer months to your advantage, read some of your longer texts then, and do also use the module reading lists. That, that your teachers, that your lecturers share with you. And you'll often find, as, as we do at Anglia Ruskin, you'll get, um, you'll get sort of uh, annotations or um, notes on your reading lists that will show what is required or essential reading, what is desired reading, or what is recommended further reading. So 
we all prioritize what is essential and then depending on the topic and your interest in it you might read further um, so the other thing I'll mention before moving on in terms of independent research, reading and independent critical inquiry. So in an, in an English degree, yes, you will have classes, you will have workshops, you will be working with um, your peers, those in your cohort. But there is also an emphasis on your own critical engagement, your own reading of writing assignments, etc. in your own time. So that is a key skill that you develop. And in the final year of an English degree, um, most degrees offer a dissertation or an independent research project where you can really um, develop your own critical work and your own interests. And I'll say a bit more about that later too. So for the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna give an overview of what our students study at Anglia Ruskin in their first semester. And these reading lists are from last year. So they might be slightly in, you know, more indicative than actually 100% accurate, uh, i.e. they are liable to change because we do up update our reading lists and change our, our syllabus from year to year. But this gives um, a, pretty, a pretty good sense of what our students study when they arrive at university. So for their first module, a History of English Literature 1, Writing Matters, which is a big survey module where our students study literature from the late 18th century to the present day. And they also study ways of writing, ways of approaching essays, ways of communicating. They will study Zadie Smith's um, short story, The Waiter's Wife, another short story by Ali Smith that's very contemporary. And then Catherine Mansfield's Bliss. Uh, I mentioned Samuel Beckett before, Waiting for Godot, the play. Imagist poetry, um, Kipling's The Man Who Would Be King. A selection of, of poems by Victorian women poets, Jane Austen's novel, Northanger Abbey, poetry from Wordsworth and Coleridge's lyrical ballads, and then William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience. And you'll notice here that we mention on this reading list that the texts are available in the Norton Anthology, and that's the Norton Anthology of English Literature, which is a really great investment, I think, for studying literature at university. Um, it can be a little bit daunting to buy at first, as it seems quite expensive, but what you get are six volumes of literary texts, um, and it dates from the early medieval period up until the present. And um, it's often, I think, especially useful for modules in your first and second year at university when you are exploring different his historical periods or different um, theoretical approaches towards literature. It gives you a very good overview and a selection from a diverse range of texts. So the other module that we offer in that first semester is called Myth, Miracle and Magic. So alongside those primary texts from History of English 1, you'd be studying this more thematic um, approach in, in this module where you'd be looking at classical literature and um, biblical influences and the role of myth and magic through um, different literary outputs. So you look here at Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, the Roman poet Ovid, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Homer's famous epic, The Odyssey, um, Apuleius's The Golden Ass, Naomi Novik's uh, fascinating novel, Uprooted, and Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. So I've just given you just a sense of what you might study in your first semester at Anglia Ruskin, and that might give you a bit of a taste as well of what a reading list might look like in terms of its primary texts, in terms in terms of the actual literature, the imaginative literature you would be studying at, at different universities. Something else that you will study um, over your time doing a, an English degree at university is literary theory. So I thought I'd say a few words as to what that means and um, why it's interesting and why it's important. Literary theory, that might be something you've come across before. You might have heard about it. You might have studied it already at, at sixth form. Um, I think a good way of approaching it is to start by considering how you use that word theory in your conversation and writing. So we might say, for example, that we have a theory about something. And then what, what do we mean when we say that? We have a theory. Why? They got that together, etc. Um, a theory is something that you can't necessarily prove, it's, it's speculation. 
And I'm quoting here from a really useful short guide to theory, the very brief introduction to literary theory by Jonathan Culler. And he explores the common usage of the word and he says, or he suggests that it does indeed suggest speculation, but with no outright true or false answer. Also, a theory of something may be complex and it might not be, or even should not be obvious. So what this means, I think, is that literary theory, literary theory, and, and this is what we do as critics studying literature, we challenge assumptions, we challenge received ideas, um, we break down um, what might seem to be obvious, or might seem to be a received truth. And through our study, we start to tease out the complications, the complexities, and the tensions in the text. And that's to engage critically. So actually, we, we always practice theory, even if we aren't consciously thinking we're doing so. So as a basic introduction, literary theory is a study of what literature is. What is literature? Why are we here? Why are we studying it? And the methods for engaging with it. And there are, from, from that, different strands of literary theory um, that have been recognised and that have developed schools, so schools of thought around them. And each of them applies a different critical perspective. So some examples might be feminism. Um, there's, there's a whole range and a, a very, very long now tradition of feminist literary criticism, Marxism, post-colonialism and psychoanalysis. So just a heads up that you will be exploring these different critical approaches as well. And often, not always, but often this will be something that you will do from the first year of your study and it will be something you'll develop over the course of your degree. Mm -hmm. Right, so just to give an overview then of what our modules look like. So I've talked a bit about the first year. Here is our second year. Again, this is liable to change depending on staff research interests, um, but you will, you will see from these lists that in the second year, you will continue with some compulsory modules. So some modules or papers that every student does. And ours are Romantic Conflicts, a module that explores Romantic period literature from the late 18th to the early 19th century. Reading Beyond Britain, um, a module that as the title suggests, extends reading beyond the British Isles to, to other literatures written in English. Uh, Modernism in the City, early 20th century literature, Victorian literature and culture, and then the European novel, where we look at a selection of novels, unsurprisingly, written from different European countries. And then you might pick any of these optional modules, um, a creative writing module on writing short fiction, a module on science fiction, a module on writing World War One literature, a Renaissance literature module on um, dialogue and debate, Morta Milton, or um, a language module on the history of the English language. And on that note, that's something else I think that is incredibly rewarding about doing a literature degree, that across different universities, you will find you'll have different options beyond studying, if I say, just English literature. You might have the option to take a module in a, in a different language or a module in a creative writing program or a history of language program, um, as there is here. So that's something to look out for. I think, I think this is a degree that can bring that kind of interdisciplinary flexibility. And then here's our third year modules. And um, third year modules, this is where you typically in the last year of your degree get even more choice because by that point you've progressed several years into your programme and um, you're developing your own interests and you do get that freedom. So compulsory here, you do have to do a dissertation, an undergraduate major project. And the dissertation is a wonderful opportunity to produce a more lengthy essay, so at Anglo Ruskin it's 10,000 words long, which might sound daunting at first, but actually once you get to it, you have a whole year to work on it, and it's it gets divided up into chunks as, as you're drafting, and especially when it's a topic that really interests you, you'd be amazed at how difficult it can be actually to say below 10,000 words. I think most of our students discover that. 
um, but the dissertation an independent learning project. And at some universities, it can be a slightly lower word count, some a little bit higher. So usually between 7,500 words and 10,000 words. And you'll work closely with a designated supervisor, supervisor, yes, a um, lecturer who works in your, in your area, who will advise you on it. And then we also have compulsory modules on Renaissance drama and contemporary fiction. But then you have a whole ream of options. Uh, so you could look at Renaissance magic. Um, you could do an employability module, careers with English. You could look at 19th century literature with Elizabeth Gaskell and the Brontes. Literature in exile, thinking about the theme of exile um, and explorations of exile in, in literature. Writing poetry, another uh, creative writing module. Romantic idealism, if you enjoyed romantic period literature. Theorising children's literature. Digital communications, so media module there. And then another um, media slash philosophy, actually, module, language flesh philosophers. So there's a whole range of, of options to choose from. Okay. I'm not going to rabbit on for too much longer. I've just got a few slides left and then we'll have lots of time for questions, which is good. But just to say something about essays, not essays even. <laughs> so it's me, me being tired. Assignments, because the actual point I wanted to make is it's not all about essays. OK, so essays are, they are a part of studying literature and, and quite a big part of it that you will develop um, ways of, of expressing yourself in writing and of um, you will practice um, writing into essay form your critical arguments, structuring essays, etc. But it's not all about essays. We also do use individual and group presentations as forms of assignment. Um, increasingly, increasingly, we've been using discussion board posts, um, so discussion boards and forums. Student conferences. I actually organised a student conference for a first year module just a few weeks ago that was really, really great fun um, and it was a really good atmosphere. And then portfolios as well that might be more creative. Um, you might get the opportunity to express yourself and your ideas in other ways than the traditional essay form. But one thing I will say about essays is the word essay does come from the French to mean an attempt. That's where Montaigne, the, the French essayist, 16th century French essayist, that's where he got his, his word essays from in his famous essays. Um, that he, from his point of view, he was always making an attempt with every argument he was looking to present in an essay. And so I think it helps to think of that. An essay is always the tip of the iceberg. You've got so much going on beneath in terms of what you're thinking about, what you're reading, what you've been observing. And the essay is just your attempt to get your main points across. So what does it mean then if you're writing a critical essay? What does it mean to read and write critically? I said I'd come back to that word. So just to give a brief overview of this, uh, and this is a key skill that you develop over the course of a literature degree. Critical analysis evaluates the arguments of other writers. So note that I've used that verb evaluates there rather than just summarizes or acknowledging. You, you engage critically by looking at the argument and then responding to it. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you agree to a point, but then there's something more to be said? Um, you know, how, how might you engage critically with someone else's argument? Critical writing also presents evidence and analysis to support an argument, and then you round your work off in a conclusion. So you might present evidence and analysis based on close reading of your texts that you're writing on. And you develop a line of argument through your essay. And I think the, the big tip is to avoid overuse of descriptive writing. So one thing not to do is to just describe or give an overview about what you're working on. You, you want to really prioritise developing an argument. And this is such a key skill in terms of transferable skills and employability, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. And here we are, transferable skills and employability. So as I mentioned, you gain an array of impressive transferable skills from studying literature. 
And these include, and I've actually put in the middle of this paragraph, critical thinking and reasoning. Um, these are really important skills in the workplace. Communication skills, both verbally and in writing. The ability to see a topic or issue from multiple angles. So going back to what I was saying earlier about engaging with different theories and, and ways of reading, walking around in others' shoes, of how we hold seminars, um, seminars of say around 10 to 20 people in them, 10 to 20 students, and where we have debates and discussions about, about complex topics. Um, you, you'll learn independent research skills and self-motivation, incredibly important skill. Time management, the ability to prioritise. I mean, even just prioritising what you're going to read from the suggested text in the reading list. Uh, team working skills and creative thinking. And what can you do with an English degree? And here I'm happy to say the answer is anything. So our former literature students go into careers in the media, journalism, arts, teaching, retail, marketing and communication, law, publishing, accountancy, consulting, librarianship, charity work, politics and much, much more. So it really is a, a degree that it just opens doors rather than closes them because you do learn so much with your transferable skills from studying literature. And of course, there's the opportunity to pursue further study. Um, we, and here at Anglia Ruskin, we do have lots of students continue on to do a master's degree in literature. And then quite a few decide to pursue a PhD as well. So I'm going to stop there as I've been talking for a while and that leaves quite a bit of time for questions. Um, so thank you for your time and I'd welcome any questions you might have, absolutely anything. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So thank you. Thanks, Cathy. That that was really helpful and, and quite insightful for me as well. Um, do, do pop any questions that you might have in the chat for, for Cathy. I just wanted to pick up actually, Cathy, if I may, about your point about um, what you can do with English literature and the answer being anything. I think that's really critical at this point um, in time because um, there's lots of evidence to show that like the job market is changing massively um, due to digitization, you know, the fourth revolution as it's being called, and and you know, automation coming in. And apparently COVID has accelerated all that. So I think it's really important for people who are thinking about what to do at university to understand that actually some of the jobs that they might do don't even exist yet. So the idea of doing something which is quite narrowly vocational can actually be a bit problematic. So my favourite example is accountants. So, for example, accountants, accountancy is one of those roles which is most likely to be automated in the future. And that's not to say that if you didn't, did an accounting degree, you wouldn't gain transferable skills. But something like English literature equips you with so many broad and transferable skills that it really is a very good option uh, from my point of view. Um, so we've got a question here. Um, do we have to study literature only or can we study a combined degree here at ARU? Great, thanks Heather and thank you to the students who asked the question as well. Oh sorry, can you hear me all right? Yeah. I'm a bit, bit accurate. So um, you at Anglia Ruskin, you can in fact study literature with another subject. So we do offer a few different combined degrees. So as well as BA English Literature, we offer, offer writing, creative writing in English Literature philosophy and literature and drama and literature so you have the option between those different combined degrees too um, so that's what we offer at ARU and obviously if you if you're interested in exploring different universities as well you'll find other combined degrees on offer there but um, yeah that's also a nice thing that I think um, and you, you might have reflections on this as well Olivia that I think if you're studying single honours English literature it's nice that in your classes you'll have a mixture of students from different cohorts so you'll have some philosophy and literature students or some drama some writing and english students that you'll get to know different students from across the faculty i mean i definitely agree quite a lot of my friends are actually from a combined degree for example joey we have the um what was it? the european novel design transgression together and his part of literature and theater so drama so i often get to see him and then if we do drama performances or we discuss a play he's really onto the subject and it's nice because i don't do drama i'm personally not very good at it but i get to see a point of view from a student 
who is studying it currently at such a level that it's just nice to get an insight on such a, such a subject. And then I have friends in creative writing, for example, Lily. She's really, really into writing. And like, for example, if I need a bit of help, I'd be like, oh, hi, Lily, could you please help me with this? Because I'm having a bit of trouble. I'm not very good at creative writing. She'd be like, yeah, sure. And this is how I do this. This is how I cope with this. So it's just nice because you get a bigger overview of the subjects in multiple areas. Whatever you look at the lesson, you can always turn to someone who knows a little bit more than you and then they can help you with that. And I really like that. So I just saw, um, thank you so much, Olivia. And it's lovely to hear as well, because I think you really um, you really hit the nail on the head with just how nice seminars are as discussion spaces as well, that you're you're not just um, learning from your reading independent, what well, you are learning independently, of course, but you're not just solitarily learning from your reading or from the teacher, you're learning from others around you and you're all learning from each other and supporting each other. And I really get that sense and I, I love teaching here for that reason and many more. I've just seen the question from Heather about examples of dissertation titles. What I'm going to do, Heather, is look some up for you. So it might just take me a minute. So if anyone else has any other questions, I'll just do that now. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of questions for, for Olivia, actually. Um, so I'm just quite interested in knowing which your favourite kind of um, modules have been or particular texts that you've come across whilst on your degree. What have you most enjoyed? Oh, that's a big question because Whenever I do get asked that question, I always think of it in terms of trimesters. So what have I done in this first year in the first trimester? Because so far I've really enjoyed every class that I have been to and all the books are really mind opening. I do mean it because despite it being different subjects, I get to learn more and knowledge is power and both pleasure as me and Henry have talked about yesterday when it comes to Milton because yes we had a whole discussion about it just before class. <laughs> um, so in terms of answering your question my favourite ones the most memorable ones I'll probably say A Small Place um, but I don't remember who was by Jennifer something but it's basically a book about post-colonization and I read that in Reading Beyond Britain and it's basically a collection of more small essays on how has colonization affected the current generation, what are the economic and political factors that are affected in a negative way and how slavery actually still exists in the 20th century. And that for me is actually my dissertation idea. I am planning to use a small place on post colonization and how British um, colonialism has affected African literature, the minor ethnic groups, basically give them a voice of how they suffered and how they have changed because of us. So that's my dissertation and that's one of the things I enjoyed. Um, if I'm going to talk about first years, my favourite class was um, Myth, Miracle and Magic. A lot of people really did enjoy that class. Um, and we looked at many tales. Mostly we looked into Homer's Odyssey and that was, oh, that took us two weeks to get through because it's a very long text, but it was definitely worth it. I really enjoyed it and so did my other friends. Um, so that was that. Um, currently, uh, so far, I'll probably say debate, dialogue and debate with Cassie. Everyone loves um, Milton and the Paradise Lost. We're obsessed with it. <laughs> we got to study book nine today. <laughs> so I was going to say, a bit, you, don't, you don't have to say that just because I'm here. It's OK. Oh, no. <laughs> I actually really enjoy it. The main reason why majority of people chose your class is because we're doing Paradise Lost. That's the main reason, because, because it's just so much. <laughs> literally everyone i'm not gonna name them because you know i don't want to <laughs> make them embarrassed but like that's the main reason because of paradise lost we could study it further that's why we wanted to choose it that's why i wanted to choose it so talking of your choices um olivia there is um we've got some questions in the chat and um, just to know what appealed to you specifically about ARU when you were applying for studying a literature degree? Were you looking at other places for literature or what were your kind of thought processes and what influenced your decision making? Oh, so when I was looking at universities, my first university that I was most interested in was actually University of Cambridge. That was like my like my biggest accomplishment if I went there. So um, I went along to a lot, quite a lot of open days. I got to know people. And the course I was interested in was the classics course. I was really interested in that. 
Um, however, I did hear a bit of feedback from other students because you know you do have to be honest sometimes with people, and they said they do have very high expectations. And the thing is, you know, what if I have a bad year, something happens, and when my grade goes down, I'll have a lot of pressure to get it back up again. And I simply didn't want that kind of environment to be pressured into perfection. When it comes to RIU, the community to me seems more relaxed and less demanding. I'm demanding on myself not other people on me, which I do actually like. And it's basically, honestly, University of Cambridge, same studying, just different reputation. I'm going to get the same degree for far less stress. And, you know, I actually get to enjoy studying here. So for me, it was more about the community and the environment I'll be studying in. And that's why I chose ROU because it's far more relaxed. Thanks, Olivia. That, that's really interesting and actually really important. I mean, one of the things that I do as part of my job is I try and match students with the right courses for them. And it really is about the individual students and students do differently well in different kind of environments. You know, you might take one student and put them in a different environment and they'll do absolutely fine. And another student in, in that environment wouldn't do so well. Um, and actually, you know, we do have students who come from us from other universities where they say, and this sort of leads on to the next question, that they like literally that the course students didn't even know their name and they felt that they were just sort of a bit lost in the numbers, perhaps at the back of you know the class. Some universities do have huge English literature cohorts, um, you know, and it is sort of, I have to say, let's just pack them in kind of thing. And they can be very good universities, but actually a very able student might not do so well in that environment. And actually they need a bit of more of that sort of personalization and, su and support that we're able to offer at ARU. So Cassie, um, how many people are usually in a seminar group or Olivia? Um, yeah, so um, as Sarah was saying, we, we do typically have, oh, not on average, smaller class sizes than at other universities. So we're very lucky in that way. So. You know, we might have, um, I mean, this morning, for example, for the Renaissance Literature class, we were looking at Milton, Paradise Lost. Um, on the register for that class this morning, it's an optional second year module, and there are 10 students in that class. So it's a really small size, and it really does make, it means everyone gets to know each other very well, and we do get into, it becomes a very, although it's um, a very thorough, discursive academic space, it's a very relaxed space, you know, it's, it's a friendly space, and I I like I like to think in you know, a very safe space where everyone feels happy to share their ideas and, and confident about talking about the, the text and the topics. Um, our biggest class sizes in terms of um, seminars, and by seminars I'm referring to workshops where students and, and, the, and the lecturer discuss their reading and their ideas together. The biggest we, we would have would be around 25, that would be the absolute biggest. Um, and usually our classes are significantly smaller than that. So I'd say usually between around 10 to 18, maybe. Um, and for some lectures, which a lecture by that, I mean, um, in the more traditional sense, um, I say the sort of old school sense of a, of a tutor standing at the front and then proclaiming content for a bit to a class, um, they might be slightly bigger. But, but yeah, our, our max would be 25. I also found some examples of dissertation titles, if you'd like me to read them to you, I can do that. And these are just a few examples, but just to give you an idea. So um, I've downloaded some anonymous former dissertations from 2015. And one title was An Exploration of External and Internal Spaces in 19th Century Gothic Literature. So that was one example. Um, another one. Um, the title, oh sorry, no, The Representation of Aging um, in Tove Janssen's Sculptor's Daughter, The Listener and the Summer Book. Um, and then Uncanny Traumas in The Return of the Soldier by Rebecca West, The Forbidden Zone by Mary Borden and Testament of Youth by Vera Britton. And I'll just give one more, which is You Don't Think I Ought to Be Back in the Asylum, Do You? Madness and Gender and Wilkie Collins, The Woman in, in, Woman in White. Mary Elizabeth Braddon's Lady Audley's Secret and Charles Reed's Very Hard Cash, A Matter of Fact Romance. So there you go. There's a selection. Thanks, Cassie. And um, that links to another question I had about um, how, how much scope there is, because you've talked about the key texts that will be studied. So how much scope there is for reading outside of those key texts? I mean, from those dissertation titles, it sounds like quite a lot, actually. 
Yeah, so for your independent research, for your major projects in third year, then absolutely, that's completely your own. So you are the one at the towards the end of your second year, and actually Liv is in this position at the moment, you'll be asked to write just your initial ideas for the major project. Obviously, they're not yet. We don't expect it to be in any way finalised, but your initial interests. Um, and then when, once we hear from our individual students what they're interested in, we match them with a supervisor, so a member of staff whose research interests merge with theirs. So, so we've already heard from Olivia. You're interested in Kincaid and in, in the small in a small um, small place, right? So you're going to be working on that, and we'll we'll find find you a good supervisor for your project. Um, in terms of the modules, it really depends. So first year first year is very much an introductory year, as to be expected. It's a year when at this university. Your, your grades from your first year do not go towards the award for your final degree. So it's a year for trying out different things. And um, usually there's slightly less flexibility for in terms of assessed work anyway, for, for reading um, beyond what's set there. But the more you progress, the more optional degrees, sorry, optional modules you'll have and the more you can pursue your own interests. And tutors are always happy to give additional recommendations Another thing I'll mention, actually, is I'm talking about primary texts, but of course, when you're working on modules, you are very much encouraged to conduct your own independent research. So to read other texts alongside the set texts and to read um, critical works that will shape your thinking and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so any more questions in the chat, please? And then I've just got one final question for you, Olivia, which is, do you have any time to read anything else? And therefore, do you still get pleasure from reading? Like, do you have time to read something that you just fancy reading or is all your time reading allocated to reading towards your degree? So when it comes to reading for enjoyment, um, obviously it can be hard, I'm not going to lie. If we have big primary texts uh, for particular modules, it can be hard for me to find like my personal time, apart from like, you know, daily living activities to actually find time for something that I enjoy reading. Um, I mean, some of the texts that we're studying in our previous modules, I did was, I was actually a big fan of. So like uh, last trimester, I chose modern science fiction because the Hunger Games and I was obsessed with Hunger Games and I just wanted to study it and read it. Um, again, depends how much you have, but the best time I realized for myself is to read the book that you enjoy before you go to bed, actually. So it's like it's like a relaxation moment for you just before you go to get to go to bed. You get tired, you get sleepy easily, and you're actually enjoying a book that you wanted to read by yourself. So for me, that would be the best time to do it. Um, otherwise, I don't really know about other people. But, no, but um, that's really yeah. good advice. Like it's kind of keeping a separation between reading for your study and just reading for pleasure and having a clear kind of place and time to do that. I think that's that's really good advice. Thank you. Um, so just a question in the chat for you, Olivia. What's the best thing about studying literature at ARU? The one best thing? Um, Make a tricky question. Maybe you could have two. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the first one that came into my head is probably the classroom size. The fact that we can you know, message our professors at any time and they're going to become available to us, make appointments and discuss stuff with us. I was really afraid at first before I started university, well, what if the professors don't have time for me? I like, you know, what if I can't get an appointment with them to discuss my essay or something? But that's not trouble at all. That's one thing I love. I can just message them or email them at any time. It will get back to me really quickly because of our small department. And I really do like the size of our department. Um, next thing, um, teachers are very important, which ones you have. <laughs> you have obviously some very good teachers, some teachers you might not like, but I'll probably say the team that we have here at RRU are very good. I'm very pleased with my studies. They provide plenty of information. They always email you in advance. My, my email box is always mainly, oh, I have updated, um, you know, this book for this week. You can go check it out now and so on. So they always email you in advance of the work that I've put up and that's really good to see because it shows to me that they are committed and that's what I like to see because I'm committed to this degree they are committed to and that's what really makes this relationship work for us. Thank you Olivia. 
Um, if there are no more questions, I think we'll um, start wrapping up there. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to Olivia for joining us. Um, uh, thank you to you for um, engaging with these sessions. And we hope we found them useful. Um, I think people may be booked for sessions later in the week, but we do have more sessions coming up, including Margaret Atwood's uh, The Handmaid's Tale, Dystopia, a session on John Keats. So there's an opportunity to still to book on for later sessions. Um, and also, if you are able, and I will also send this via email as well, um, but we'd really appreciate it if you could feed, um, just complete our feedback form. That's really useful for us because it knows how you found it. It helps us know things we can do better for another time, but also helps us to continue to offer these sessions in the future. So thank you. And thank you to you, Cassie, um, for delivering that session. It was really insightful. And uh, it's the sort of thing that I wish that I'd had access to before making my university choices, because I have to say that I wish I'd done English literature at university and I didn't. Um, and I think this kind of talk would put my, my mind at rest and perhaps encourage me to do that. So, yeah, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. And do um, if you've got any questions, actually, I'm going to put my email into the chat just in case, because I'm the course leader for English literature. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about the degree or anything, any questions about studying English at university, just get in touch. Thank you. And thanks, Olivia, as well. Yeah, and I should say as well, I'm just going to post um, about our um, next open day, which is actually next month, the 23rd of um, April. Um, so that is that's really good opportunity. Go along to open days. You meet, meet people like Olivia, you meet Cassie, get to ask any kind of questions that you want and really get the feel for the place that you might be studying in and work out if it's the right thing for you, because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Thank you very much and hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.